If you can make customers happy, you work with people you want to work with, and you're passionate about what you do, it should mean that other people respond to that and buy into that as well. So Julian Heron, founder of Huel, a company that's gone from nothing in 2015 to a company that's now got over 45 million of sales and one of the most exciting, disruptive food businesses of the last decade. Thanks for hanging out. Thanks for having a beer. No, thank you. Cheers. Cheers. So we'll get on to the Huel story in, yeah. in a minute, but where, where did things start for you professionally in your career? And how did you end up starting a business? Okay, so my, my background is online marketing. I did that for probably about 15 years plus. I worked for sort of big corporate companies. And um, to be honest, it's the simple answer is I got, I, I got frustrated having to commute into London and back. <laughs> and um, it was about an hour and a half each way. So it was three hours a day, 15 hours a week. It was a, it was a lot of hours traveling. And it just felt like dead time to me. And I met some guys who was doing affiliate marketing. And uh, they were working from home. And they were making very, very good money. And I just thought there must be a better way than what I'm currently doing. And uh, so I spent about a year trying to suss out how to do things. And then um, got confident enough that I thought I could, I could earn a decent salary. I said to my wife, we've got some money in the bank. Yeah. We've got enough money to last six months. Um, can we, can, we uh, you know, can I go full time at this? I jacked my job. And she said, OK. So within three months, I was earning more money than my salary. And basically, uh, off it went from there on and just carried on going. Three years later, I sold that business to an American company and had enough money to retire. <laughs> but I was 40 years old and um, got itchy feet again and thought I wanted to do something else. And so what I did is started another, another business, which was called Body Hack. And uh, that was a health and fitness business. And the idea of that was to try different fitness programs, different exercise programs, different diets, and see which ones actually work, take photographic evidence to prove so it's evidence-based rather than just being me just talking like a good game. And uh, I was the first guinea pig. Three months later, I was gone down from 21% body fat down to 11% body fat. So I was like the leanest I've ever been. I ended up cooking the same thing every day. So basically breakfast was like five egg whites, uh, 20 grams of porridge oats, 20 grams of coconut oil, and 20 grams of blueberries. And at 11 o'clock it was an egg and broccoli. And then at one o'clock it was 200 grams of spinach and 200 grams of turkey cooked from scratch. My friend said, well, I'm at work, I can't do that. <laughs> so my afternoon snack was a um, protein shake. And that protein shake was the easiest meal to, to make. Yeah. All you got to do is put some water into a, a shaker, put scoop in the protein, shake it, and you're done. And it yeah. made me think, right, people want the results, but they can't get the results. It's too complicated. The protein shake's super simple. So why don't we put all the essential nutrients into a single product, like a protein shake, give it the same convenience, but give it the nutrition that you actually truly need, because protein, you can't live off protein. Mm. And that was the, the genesis of Huel, and that's where we got to. So, I mean, for a lot of people, I mean, that's where the story finishes. And I think if you ask most people what their dream scenario, it's 40 years old, have yep. worked hard, have done well, yep. have got enough money to never have to worry about money again, yep. to chill out, to enjoy time with their family, to pursue hobbies and passions, that kind of stuff. But yep. you you got itchy feet after a year and, and decided to hell with that. Yep. But yeah, there is more to life than money and you want to do something. So what I wanted really was something that I was going to be proud of, something I was going to be... Uh, it's going to make a difference. It's going to sort of give back a little bit, and and keep me busy for four, three, four days a week. I didn't want a full, <laughs> didn't want a full day, full time job. Um, but as you know, again, when you start a company, it takes over your life slowly, and you you become very obsessed with what you're doing, and you have to put so many hours in. So I mean, the first couple of years of fuel, I probably was doing um, all day, most evenings and weekends as well. And so it was, you know, when I was first launched, it was myself. So I was doing, I was packing the boxes. I was um, writing a copy for the website. I was getting the photography done. I was uh, customer service. I was order in person. You know, I was doing everything. So it was basically me when I first launched. Um, but, you know, looking back, it's been a very um, fulfilling journey. And we've now got a product with hundreds of thousands of customers. We've sold 25, well, I think actually the last count was 27 million meals worldwide. 27 million meals. And, uh, you know, our customers are very uh, engaged customers. We get, you know, like your guys, you know, your, your customers are very engaged as well. We, we've got very passionate customers and it's just very fulfilling. You know, I, I know that if I just spend that money when it's out on the beach in Barbados, I'm going to look back when I'm 60 and I wouldn't be as uh, fulfilled as if I had started 
secure. So I think, it's, it, again, it was a, a good decision to do. And uh, it has taken over, but it, um, it was the right thing to do, yeah, yeah. If someone's never seen or heard of fuel before, what's, yep. what's the elevator pitch? How would you describe it in 30 seconds? What okay, is it? so basically it's a nutritionally complete meal, which means that you get all of your central nutrients in a single product. Yeah. So that means that they're, they're, uh, you get your protein, your fats, your carbs, your fiber, your vitamins, minerals, and we've got phytonutrients, which is basically the good stuff you get from plants. Yeah. So you get all that in a single product. I typically will use it for uh, breakfast or lunch. Mm -hmm. Put water in, you add the powder, shake, go. It's quick, convenient, but it's nutritionally complete and it's cost effective. So a meal costs about £1.33, something like that. Yeah. So you had that idea, what yep. did you do next? Uh, Google. <laughs> Google, God bless Google. <laughs> yeah, went up to Google and started looking for a nutritionist, dietitian, somebody who really knew their stuff. So I eventually found James Collier, who is now our co-founder. Co he's based in the UK, went and met him. He's, he, he, he knew what he was talking about. He'd worked, he'd got the academic background, he'd got a degree in it. He'd worked in uh, national health as a dietitian for seven years. He'd also worked with bodybuilders, martial artists, strong men, people like that. So actually had the practical knowledge as well, what actually you do need in your diet. Yeah. And so I spoke to him and gave him a project to come back two weeks later with a, a formula. And two weeks later he did. And that formula is pretty similar to the formula we've got today. It has been tweaked and improved, but it's still fundamentally the same thing. There's only six main ingredients in here, which is oats, pea protein, rice protein, flax seeds, sunflower, and MCTs, which is a fat from coconut. And that's yeah. it, six main ingredients. And then we add a vitamin and mineral uh, blend to make up any shortfall. The majority does come from those six main ingredients, but any shortfall is made up with the vitamin blend. So when did you sell your first product <sighs> to a paying customer? Right, so the first product we sold was June 2015. I think it was the 17th of June 2015 we went June live. 15. So I think I, I know exactly. So we went, we, um, uh, we went live and we got orders on the first day. And I think the orders came from, I'd literally been chatting on a, a startup group on, on Facebook. There was about 17,000 people in that group and I was just chatting about, or asking questions about certain things. I'm not trying to promote the product, but some people are interested in what you're doing. And I, I said, and I think that's where our, our, our initial orders came from. And so literally from day one, we got orders and within the first week or two, we got some PR and national press because it was quite a sort of controversial product. So it just has just grown consistency there, there, thereafter. So the first, we launched in June, June to January would our be our first financial year. Yeah. I think we did 750K. The following- it's amazing, straight out the gates for this to have never existed before, to yep. just start with a product and a website and in six months, yep. start off that. Yeah. I mean, the amount of businesses that start up that never do that much turnover in their entire lifetime yep. with a business, yep. like that's an amazing first six months. We did really, really well. So we went off in the first six months, we did 750. The following year, we did 5.7 million. The following year, we did 14.1. And this year, we're going to do 45, well, 40 to 45 million. So the growth that you've had is, is, is almost scary. And I, I run a high growth business, but the growth hasn't been nearly as explosive as yours has. And it's just so difficult, I mean, to grow at that speed, just the challenges, the headaches that you have on an almost daily basis. Yep. It, it's hard to understand. What have been your biggest challenges in doing what you're doing and building what you've built over the last few years? I don't know if there's been any big, big challenges. I think most of the challenges are, like you say, every single day, you're problem solving every single day. So every single day you come into work and you know you've got to create a new path that hasn't been there before. So it's not like you open a book up and you say, right, this is what I do. Every day you have to say, you have to make a choice. Do we do this or do we do that? How do we do that? When do we do that? How much do we pay for that? We've never, we've never made a bar before. We've never made cereal before. Who do we even, who makes it? Yeah. Where, where do we get it made? What size box do we need to make? So you're just constantly making every day different choices of what to do. And so you, you listen to your customers. I mean, that's the key thing, listen to customers. We've got a big team now, we've got 60 people in our team. So we listen to them, we do product testing with them. Yeah. Um, but in terms of big challenges, I mean, how big to go, how fast to go, where to go. Like we've launched in America uh, June last year. And lots of people said, don't spread yourself too thin. Don't go out there. It's a big place. It's hard to compete, blah, blah, blah. You're going to have, but Again, that's worked for us. We've been lucky again. That's that's worked very nicely. Um, so, you know, food is a thing you put inside your body. You need to make sure it's made correctly. So you're constantly having to rely on your factory to do things. We go down there and see how the factory's being made and, and ensure they're making the right stuff. Taste is another thing we have to try and optimize. We, we're a company which is nutrition first. So taste has been, um, maybe we were 75% nutrition, 25% taste. 
we're now trying to get closer together. So taste is now becoming, you know, feedback for when you go into mass markets. We may we we say now we're 51% nutrition, 49% taste. Whereas most products in the supermarket are. 90% taste, 10% nutrition at best. They don't really care about yeah. nutrition. We, we do care about nutrition, which is fundamentally the primary purpose of food. It's not for taste, it is for nutrition, right? It doesn't give you the right nutrition, what's the point of it? So, um, biggest challenge is just so many little bits. So that's what it is, it's constant. And you, you, if you're not careful, you can get burnt out. So, I don't know what your experience has been, but for, <laughs> for the first two years I was really quite hardcore yeah. uh, and I've now tried to bring my hours down we brought a CEO on so I gave up the CEO role I just felt it wasn't for me yeah. um, it was um, my background is marketing I think that's what I'm good at brand marketing customer uh, service but uh, the other sides of the CEO role are you know, finance operation HR recruitment and some of those things I just found not interesting um, and just didn't feel like I was giving it the best that it should receive and so I was spreading myself across so many things that you just you just feel like you're not good at anything you're literally just doing little bits of everything but not to any standard so I said no I'll give that up to somebody else we brought a, um, a guy who's done it before so we brought a CEO in and uh, yeah that's made a big difference and now I can go back to what I think I'm good at and give that due care and attention and when did you take in the CEO oh, time flies mm, probably about eight nine months ago maybe a little bit longer and have you found that quite tough from no, a get on, perspective? No, he's, he's, he's very calm. I'm, I get a bit, um, <laughs> um, what's the word? Excited. I, yeah. <laughs> passionate. So, yeah, passionate. And so he's good that he calms me down. You know, we, we've got a division of work, so we know what each other does. And no, I think some people, they, they, they don't want to give up that sort of role. They, they feel like, uh, I'm not, I haven't got a big ego at all. I don't really care about that sort of stuff. So for me, it's been a very good decision. That means I can take a little bit more time off, so I don't have to work weekends anymore. I mean, uh, James has just flown out to America and he's had to go to New York, LA, Puerto Rico in, in less than a week. And I would have had to do that, but I didn't. So I can stay at home and see my friends and do the things I want to do. So it's definitely been a, a, a good decision for me. So anyone that's built a business I think has had one moment where the challenges seem insurmountable, when everything's going against them, when they're under pressure. When was the closest you came to saying, to hell with this, I'm, I'm done? Did you uh, have that moment? There was, there was probably two. One was the, the time when the uh, big multinational let us down. So this was pre-launch. Um, and probably pre-launch, there's probably several occasions where I nearly gave up. Yeah. I nearly went, that's it, I'm done. Um, because the business that he all span out of uh, was a company called Body Hack. And I probably had burnt about 80k in that company, so it didn't didn't generate a profit. It was more startup costs, and so of course, when when I said to my wife, right, I'm going to do some, I've just burnt 80k. Now <laughs> I'm going to start something else. There were several occasions where I thought, right, she's not going to be very happy if I burn even more money. And I felt like, what am I doing? Why I don't need to work? Why am I doing this? And so there was this there was this question mark of why am I doing it? I can't really burn any more money because I'm going to look stupid because I've done it twice. So there were certain points where I thought, right, should I just pull the plug now before I burn too much money? So there was definitely times pre-launch where I nearly just said, that's it, I'm done, uh, and just uh, pulled the plug. And then I think uh, there's probably been several occasions where we do get, we always got very highly engaged, passionate customers. We've got a lot of people who don't like us as well. So it's quite a polarizing type of product. People can't, um, some people can't get their heads around it. And so what, what do people not like when they don't like it? <sighs> so, We've all been sort of brainwashed to a certain extent that food is all about the way it looks and um, the, the taste, and we've been trained that that's what food is. It's, it's taste, textures, it's an art form, it should look beautiful, all these TV programmes. When was the last time you heard a TV chef, which are all over TV, even mention nutrition? They just don't do it. Never. They just don't do it. But that is the primary purpose. So when we start talking about nutrition, and we've got a food that we don't talk about taste, really, People just think that we're this uh, space food, it's, it's, it's alien, it's, um, it's rubbish, you can't live off that, you, you have to chew something, you can't just live off, um, they call it liquid, it's always not a liquid, it's, up. it's powder, yeah. you add liquid too to consume it, it doesn't, it, 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 you know, we've all eaten bread, bread is a powdered food, but then it's reconstituted into a solid loaf. Yeah. People can see that and go, that's fine. They see Huel as powder, they don't accept it. And so it does take a little bit of time for people to, to, uh, to come on board. 
but um, yeah, so some people, you know, social media, people can be very, very vicious and very nasty. <laughs> Twitter is and a place sometimes. It, oh, it's, it, and sometimes it's soul destroying. When you sort of put your heart and soul in something and then people are so nasty, you do sort of think, what, what's the point? Why am I doing this if people are going to be like so uh, anti it? But then on the other side, you do get people who are so nice that our customers are so sort of passionate that it sort of keeps you going. So I suppose there's been times when you think, what's the point of this? You know, like you get such um, grief off people, constant grief. So we do a lot of social media advertising, a lot of social media engagement, and you do get both sides of the, the coin. And uh, I, I did all of that for, I did all the social, every time we put an advert up top, I think it's um, uh, plight or the right thing to do to respond to people. So yeah. even if they're being nasty, we usually respond to everybody. Yeah. Uh, if they're being ridiculously nasty, we just like blank, blank them. But in general, we try and respond to everybody. And doing that job can be soul destroying. I think at certain times, I just thought, what am I, why am I doing this? This is, this is a lot of a hassle, a lot of grief. And um, I'm not enjoying this part of it. So what's, what's the point? But uh, no, just kept on pushing through. And then you get a nice email from someone or you get a nice um, comment from somebody and it keeps you going. So in general, there hasn't been the sort of earth shattering this is going to break us type of moment it's been more of just constant churn and constant pain sometimes of just having to just sort of just have to keep going through it every single day but then we've got to a point now where you know you look back and you think it was worth it i suppose it's equivalent to somebody doing a marathon run or something <laughs> yeah. when you're doing the marathon run it's probably not much fun every yeah. step probably is a, is a painful step but if you keep going at the end you know you're going to look back and go i did it so i suppose that's sort of the equivalent so, Julian, one thing I love about Huel is how clear, how simple, how easy to understand the mission is. What is that mission? So the mission is to make nutrition complete, affordable, convenient food with minimal impact on the environment and animals. So me personally, I'm a, you know, I love my animals. I don't want them to be harmed. I've seen some of the, the, the videos. I, I would like to be a vegan, but I just struggle to do that. You know, I just I, I've tried and I can't really do it. So, you know, I just think Vegan is maybe a step too far for a lot of people, um, but cutting your meat uh, consumption down yeah. could be something most people could do. And if the whole world cut their meat um, consumption by just 10%, we'd be in a lot better place because during my time, I've, I've realized how bad it is. Um, uh, livestock production causes more greenhouse gases than all of the cars, planes, it's and trains crazy, com yeah. combined. I think it's almost twice as much. It's just this stat that blows people's minds. Because you think, if you think about kind of greenhouse gas, how it's portrayed in the media, you see traffic jams, you see yeah. huge factories, where in yeah. fact livestock farming is doing more damage than these things. Exactly. So it's we don't need. I mean, it's, it's not natural to eat the amount of meat. I mean, most people probably eat meat every single day. Yeah. You know, simple as that. You have your meat and two veg for your evening meal, or you have a, a bacon butty or whatever. You know, people eat meat every day. That is not natural. If you if you go and live in the wilds, you try and catch meat. It's quite hard to catch, right? So you're <laughs> probably not going to eat it every day. You're probably going to eat majority of your diet will probably be plant based. And then when you catch a deer or you catch a rabbit or something like that, then you have a bit of meat. So for us in the Western society to have meat every day is not natural. So um, we we shouldn't eat as much as we should, but we've just it's now ingrained in our culture to eat meat every day. So, uh, you know, there, there is trends in vegan and flexitarian and um, meat-free Mondays and all this sort of stuff. And we just feel like if we could provide a product which makes, you get all nutritional complete product, but it is vegan, it's gonna make people's lives easier and they can then cut their meat consumption down. So it's very important for us. Yeah, it's a fantastic mission. So what you're doing can make people healthier, can deliver amazing nutritional benefits and has a positive impact on the planet. It's a pretty inspiring mission. Yep, correct. It's, it's tick, tick, tick in a lot of boxes. We, we sort of, I think we've got lucky, I'm, not, I'm not, not sure, but we just started off on the right foot with the right mission statement. And those sorts of things really help with recruitment as well. So when we're, we've recruited some really top people and uh, they, they, they were inspired by the mission as well. And I think that really does help to have that as a, if you're starting a company, think about those types of things from day one. Don't try and bolt them on later. I think uh, it looks a little bit artificial if you try and do that. I think if you start on the right foot, it can really make a difference. So this, this business that you started in 2015, that you started after you should have maybe been retired and, yep. and done for good, in a recent transaction has been valued at over 220 million. Yep. That is insane. In four years, nothing to 220 million. How does that feel? It, it feels a bit unreal. Um, it feels good. We got lucky in some ways. We sort of hit, we, we hit a certain number of trends at the right time. My intention was to do, do something good that I was going to be proud of, but n n 
money was not the, the primary purpose of why I started it because I already had that. I wanted to do something I was into and something I was, I was um, proud of and that's probably resulted in certain choices that I made where we overspent on certain stuff. We didn't cut corners, we didn't do certain things. Whereas if you were just thinking money, 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 you might have taken things down a different path. It might not have worked out. So I know you guys are very passionate about what you do and that's worked out for you. So maybe that is the sort of key to these types of things is it don't start with how do I make money? Maybe you start with how do I do something I'm passionate about, something I'm, I'm into. And that ends up with people following you because they understand that you've done it for the right reasons, not just to make some cash. I think it's such a great piece of advice and it's something we focus on. We want to do something that we love, that we're insanely passionate about and we trust that by doing that we might be able to make some money at some point. Yep. But the starting point is always do something that we absolutely love and that comes from a place of passion, not a financial place. Yeah, indeed. So, I mean, we've got a little thing up on the board uh, at work about um, sort of rules of the game. The number one is to make customers happy. So. Um, you know, we're passionate about what we do, but making customers happy is sort of, like you say, is, is, it doesn't say make money, yeah. you know, number one. Number one is uh, make customers happy. Number two is don't be a dick. So <laughs> at work, we don't want anybody is, is um, you know, I, I want to go to a place where I, I want to work with everybody. So, you know, I worked too many places where you just get people who are just not, not nice people. And uh, uh, so I've recruited everybody at work. I've interviewed everybody. And uh, so I think we've got a good group of people. And I just think that if we start with those two, those two main things, then the rest of it should flow out. If you can make customers happy, you work with people you want to work with, and you're passionate about what you do, it should mean that other people respond to that and buy into that as well. And so, yeah, you guys have got some fantastic engaged customers. I think we have too, and I think that's probably because of that starting point. And what does the future hold for Huel? Well, good question. So. Um, we are now in America, we're now in Europe, we're now in the uh, UK is very strong for us still. We've got three products, but we're bringing the fourth product out in, again, it's been slow, <laughs> maybe the end of this year. We've got a ready to drink version of fuel, so it's the even more convenient version, which we think will be even more mass market friendly. And uh, we're just in that early sort of growth stage, and it's just about um, getting into the mass market now. So we've not gone to retail yet. We haven't got a mass market friendly product in the sense of this RTD. Once you've got those two products, then we think that we'll do extremely well. Ah, sounds exciting. Yep. And business aside, you've built a phenomenal business. You've also provided 27 million meals for people, which is almost a mind boggling thing. How do you comprehend 27 million meals? I, I can't really, <laughs> I suppose in some ways it is, yeah, it's crazy, crazy numbers. Um, but in some ways it just feels like we're just scratching the surface. We haven't really started. I mean, the penetration is still tiny in comparison, so we've still got so much more headroom to go into. We must be, in the UK, the, the, the penetration is you know, probably less than 1% of people use fuel at the moment. So it's just got, and you know, we, I don't think everybody's going to use fuel every day, no way, but even if just everybody uses it a couple of times a week or once a week or something like that, it still means we've got so much more headroom to grow into. We're just about to launch in China. Yeah. Uh, we're looking at other places across the world. So, you know, the world's a big place. There's just so much opportunity. Um, and finally tonight, would you recommend me adding Huel to my punk IPA? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, no. I don't think a that'd be a good Saturday thing. night out, yeah. no? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, get my beer, get my nutrients, get my nutrition, get yeah, my protein. maybe we'll do a beer version, maybe. <laughs> Thanks so much for hanging out today. Love the business, love the mission, and well done in what you've done so far. Oh, thank you very much. Love you guys too. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.